<sighs> Hello and welcome to the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. The date is August 28th, 2024. The time is 7.04. We have all members present tonight except Rachel and staff are David Simek and Aaron Jock. Um, let's see. We have a packed agenda tonight, so um, I have nothing to report from my report, and I'll hand it over to Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll be very brief because I know it is a packed agenda. Um, a couple of quick updates for the commission. Um, one is that I was out of the office today, but I know uh, the work to... Um, address the flooding issues down at the Fort River Farm um, conservation area slash um, uh, community gardens has been ongoing early uh, late last week and early this week. And I think uh, drainage has been put in there. I, I, I was down there Monday, I think of this week, um, but uh, it looks really great. I think it will, it will address the issues of flooding in the parking lot. The parking lot is regraded. So water will, will uh, sheet flow off the parking lot and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the work also dealt with a, uh, a drainage pipe coming from an adjacent property. So I think that'll look really good when it's done. And I didn't get down there today because I was out of town, but uh, I think it's nearing completion and it should really show some great results for both the parking lot and also the gardeners there. Um, trails at Hickory Ridge are coming along really nicely. Uh, we are not ready for ribbon cutting or anything like that, but um, we are, I would say, for the Loop Trail and the North-South Trail, I would say we're probably, you know, 85% done on both of those. Um, we still have uh, things to order and, and install, like benches and kiosks and new signage, and also to address the uh, parking, um, uh, parking plan as per... Um, uh, the site plan review with the planning board. So that's coming along nicely. Aaron and I will be working with a, with a consultant we have on, uh, on, on staff, if you will, to um, uh, finish the, the connection between the Loop Trail to the west and the North-South Trail, uh, likely in September, early October. That's the uh, Mass Trails grant that we got. And that includes rehabbing one of the main bridges over the Fort River. So that's coming along nicely. Um, let's see other quick updates. We are still waiting for word on the puffer spawn grants that we put in. Uh, you may recall some months ago, uh, Aaron and I worked to put in a grant, uh, to, uh, one grant for uh, dam and dike uh, improvements up at Puffer Spawn. So we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. We we feel like they're really they were really good applications. So I think Aaron and I are going to be. <laughs> Semi crushed if we don't get it. It's such a great project, and uh, you know it's it's very much in need up there at Puffers. And then lastly, this is the last week of um, testing at Puffers Pond. As you know, it's been a challenging year yet again with uh, high E. coli levels. Um, where I think it's been reported in the paper, um, I'm kind of putting together kind of a, a, a think tank uh, group uh, just looking at. Uh, how can we address the uh, the high E. coli levels in Puffer's Pond? Uh, we reached out uh, in the past and and recently to some folks at UMass to help us, and we're going to do some uh, upstream testing of of uh, the Cushman Brook to see if we can identify any upstream uh, sources of that contamination. And uh, as I've said before, and in the paper and and in various um, uh, media reports, I think it's a combination of a lot of factors up at Puffer's Pond. It's it's 25 years of accumulated sediments, it's ducks, it's geese. There may be some uh, under underperforming uh, failing septic systems upstream. Uh, there may be some dog waste. There, there's a lot of uh, street runoff. There's a lot of ways that E. coli can get into Puffer's Pond and it's not gonna be an easy fix, but um, we're, gonna, we're gonna really kind of double our efforts, redouble our efforts to try to address that because we just can't go through another summer of of this many advisories on high E. coli levels. So, so I think I'll stop there. Um, happy to take any quick questions um, before I know you launch into your very uh, full agenda. Thanks, Dave. I actually have a question. So your stop date for testing is that, I don't, I don't know, how do you determine that? I'm just noting that today was move-in day for UMass and there might be some interest in swimming at puffers and just, um, 
if you know considering that maybe the swimming season is more prolonged than it used to be if there's um, any interest in continue testing for the i don't know through september or something like that yeah i will look at the long term or maybe the 10-day forecast michelle it's a good point i'll look at the 10-day forecast um, typically, we kind of go by the state guidelines, which are kind of Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, but, you know, it's it's not a huge expense to to go for a little bit longer. But I'll, I'll take a look at um, I'll take a look at um, the 10 the day forecast. I will say, frankly, I was quite surprised that um, we did not pass this this week. But but that was based really on the. Um, not on the test itself, but uh, or or this week, but it was based on the the five day average, or excuse me, the five week average. Um, so the pond is actually much better than it was two weeks ago, or four weeks ago, or six weeks ago. It's just if the the I think it's the five week average uh, is above the state limit, then we have to issue the advisories and and essentially close it to swimming. Um, but with colder temperatures at night, um, you know, the, the pond is cooling. That's always good uh, because bacteria uh, like warmer temperatures to uh, uh, do their thing. So I, I think the levels will continue to go down in buffers in September. But we can take a look at the 10-day forecast. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I was, Dave, I was just going to ask about that. You know, you mentioned trying to work with UMass and that this really isn't uh, acceptable to have this many closures and warnings over the summer. So are you, if you're going to stop testing, then uh, I'm just curious if you would be open to continuing testing throughout, um, if you're going to be working to try to figure out where this E. coli is coming from, I would assume you would want to continue testing. Are you looking to UMass to pick up that testing? Is that one of the ways in which you'll be working with UMass? Um, I say UMass often with some optimism, and and again, it, it's we've we've had some good yeah. conversations with some of the faculty at UMass. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, it's just it's hard to get traction with UMass faculty on something like this. It's just uh, it's just a very small issue, if you will, um, from the big picture of what UMass is focused on. So it's. It's uh, I've not gotten a lot of traction. I think um, I I've already kind of assumed that we will pick up the tab. I, I doubt very, very frankly that they will pick up the cost because there is a cost to testing every week or doing extensive testing. So um, it's anywhere you know it can range from fifty dollars and up per sample. So you know that doing extensive sampling can really run into the hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Um, I would not. We are not going to test. You know, October, November, December. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna do anything like that. Um, so um, we'll. I think I think most of this is gonna fall to Amherst. To be perfectly honest, I, I have had some good conversations with UMass faculty, but it's just. Uh, I think they would. What I've heard is, if they if this were part of a larger study of say climate change and how that's affecting swimming areas in Western Massachusetts or in Massachusetts, that would be of interest. But looking at one six and a half, seven acre pond in Amherst is just, it doesn't have the, the gravitas that a larger study. I will say that, you know, last week, I think there were approaching a hundred lakes and ponds in Massachusetts that failed the state, the, um, you know, failed to meet the state standard. So, we're not alone. Lake Wyola has failed much of the summer. Um, it's 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 a statewide issue. So uh, uh, we feel it in it. We feel it in Amherst, but it is across the state. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, then, is this something that is going to be rolled into the MS4 program? And as a potential for, I mean, UMass has a rather robust civil engineering department, don't they? I would think we that do. somebody would potentially be interested, not in necessarily the six or seven acres of Puffer's Pond, but the entire watershed and how um, green infrastructure implementation can help to reduce bacteria in swimming ponds in Western Massachusetts. It sounds like an awfully nice size project for somebody to dig their teeth into. If, 
we can get some traction. And if anyone knows anyone who who may want to do that, that you know, we're we're all ears, we're open to that. I will say, you know, the Fort River also has extremely high um, bacteria levels. So we're also looking at the Fort River and we're working with the Fort River Watershed Association on, on that effort as well. So it's the Cushman Brook, it's the Fort River. You know, we haven't even tested below Puffer's Pond because there's not really that much swimming that goes on below Puffer's Pond in the mill. There's some wading and I imagine a little bit of swimming, but between Puffer's Pond and uh, Lake Warner, I'm sure the levels of E. coli are likely very high as well, but uh, the Fort River is is uh, under under some stress. So uh, I think we got to roll up our sleeves and do more testing and see if we can come up with a comprehensive solution uh, to. But but we do you know uh, we do need to also look at the bigger picture of Puffer's Pond is filling in. It needs to be dredged. It's it's a it's a shallow water body for much of those seven 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 plus acres. Um, mm -hmm. It is not no longer ten feet deep, twelve feet deep, fourteen feet deep. Many parts of the pond are now three feet deep and three to four feet of sediment, and uh, it's very you know in the summer months it it heats up very quickly. So yeah, All so right. we're we're rolling up our sleeves. I I want to try not to have repeat of twenty three twenty four summers and see if we can begin to address some things before the 25 season. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'd love to revisit this in the quote, quieter months of winter. So maybe we can come back to the to the issue and the planning and I have ideas, but um, onward with the agenda for now. Um, Okay, land use subcommittee, Alex, I don't see your face, um, but if you're there and you want to, yeah, there you are. Do you want to take yes. a couple minutes to yes. give us an update? Yes, I want to start uh, with the agricultural policy that we sent out earlier and thank Rachel for her comments. We have looked them over, we've integrated them, and I know she's not here but uh, she may look at the recording and know that we thanked her. <laughs> For this meeting, this conservation committee meeting, we have available in the folder, our dog policy. And we also have going with it, a memo in draft um, uh, with some ideas on administrative ideas on how to tackle the dog issue and the committee Worked on those ideas with Dave and Aaron present, went through a ranking process, and what you see is the result of several meetings' work. So if you care to comment on both, uh, Aaron, I think, has a date to suggest when we would like to have comments back. And again, those two things are in the folder for, on the subcommittee for this meeting. Thanks, Alex. I think Aaron on their original agenda, you had nine four, but uh, that's fast approaching. So I would suggest at least uh, two to three weeks on this one, similar to the previous point. And just for commissioners, this is kind of a big one. So it, it's a big issue with a fairly short policy that we um, spend a lot of time to make succinct and clear. Um, so we would definitely appreciate any sort of input and thoughts commissioners have on this one. Um, yeah, do we want to decide on a date right here? Let's see. By yeah, I prefer to have it a little shorter than than for the ag policy, just because um, as time goes on, people will get forgetful. Okay, so when's our next? Is the yeah. is the yeah. fourth our next meeting? I wanted. I would prefer to have the comments come in before the next subcommittee meeting. Before the next subcommittee, which is the second. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be that meeting. That's pretty close. <laughs> it would be the meeting after that. Excuse me. I think we went through this at our meeting. And okay. Well, the next subcommittee meeting might be the 16th after the second so maybe we could just decide on the 11th 
which is two weeks from now, and that's the date of our next uh, CONCOM meeting, which is also before our next subcommittee meeting. So seems to fit the bill. Any comments on that, September 11th? Okay, let's set that one. All right, so any inputs? Much appreciated. Um, fairly uh, relevant to the work on the subcommittee. Um, so any comments appreciated. Okay, anything else, Alex? Or nope, that's it. We okay. will Great. we will be presenting you with a policy issue ready for your review with each commission meeting, trying to get it all done by the end of this calendar year, thanks to the extension that was granted. So it'll roll right along. Great. Thanks, Alex. Okay, uh, we have 10 minutes. Um, shall we do some other business? Emergency yes. certification. Yeah. Um, so the emergency certification um, was issued basically the, the um, uh, Plum Springs is a conservation area that's owned by the town of Amherst. There are several ponds, beaver pond impoundments that are located upstream of Middle Street on the property. Um, we've gotten um, some grants over the years from MSPCA for the pond levelers to try to control the water level because the water levels in those ponds can get really, really high and threaten um, Middle Street if they were to um, breach. One of the pond levelers was not functioning properly and water was um, getting really, really impounded up there. So we needed to repair the the pond leveler. So um, basically bring the water level down about, I think it was just about six inches. So um, that emergency cert was issued since the last meeting just to repair that. Thanks, Erin. Yeah. Um, any questions from commissioners on this one? Okay, seeing none, um, we're looking for a motion to ratify the emergency certification for repair of the pond level or Plum Springs construction area. So moved. Um, I have a Bruce second. on the motion and Jason on the second. Um, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, let's do a request for minor administrative change to order of conditions, starting with Amherst College. Okay. Um, so in your packets, I put some information from Bucky Sparkle. Um, there was a, a very minor change to the Amherst College order of conditions. This was for the recently approved um, uh, energy upgrade area they had a change to the proprietary bmp that was proposed it was the um uh it's like the equivalent of like a deep sump catch basin but it's a proprietary unit and the unit that they had originally specced i don't know if it wasn't available they needed to replace it with an with an alternate they sent along all of the details on the um, substituted unit and updated their o m plan to um, reflect the change. So it's basically just switching from one unit, same company manufacturer to another. So um, I don't have any objection to the minor adjustment in the plan, but it needs to be reviewed and approved by you folks. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions from commissioners? Bruce. Um, I believe that Sparkle said that the new one is even more efficient than the old one by several percentage points. Yes. yes. Stronger capacity to clean and remove um, TSS and, and phosphorus, I believe. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, unless there's any further comments, we're looking for a motion to approve the minor administrative change to order of conditions to EP number 0890739. So moved. So moved. I think that was Alex. 
second. Right. <laughs> Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Um, Hickory Ridge. Yes. Um, there was a um, very minor, what I would describe as fairly negligible change to the pole locations um, for the Hickory Ridge solar facility, um, relocating a couple of poles for the, um, the poles that are on the interior of the site, um, connecting to the um, Eversource or national grid poles that are at the road. So um, there was a figure in your packet that basically showed where the adjusted locations were proposed. Um, again, pretty negligible, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. Any commissioner comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, we're looking to for a motion to approve the minor administrative change order conditions, DEP number 0890728. I'll make that motion to approve minor administrative change order of conditions, DEP 0890728. I will second. We're on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? I and I'm an I. Okay, last one, Mill Lane. Yes. So, um, also a figure in your packets on this one. Um, so there was an order of conditions issued for Mill Lane. Um, you might remember it was a um, a rather large um, uh, gym workout area that was constructed um, on a single family home property. There was previously a driveway which had been approved um, outside of the 50 foot to go around the structure for like landscaping and vehicle access. Um, the landowner no longer wants to install that driveway in the location between the 50 foot and the um, the building. So, but instead they're going to be installing a deck. Um, just a pretty narrow deck running along the edge of the structure, but it's outside of the 50 foot. Um, so decks, sheds, patios, pools, anything that's um, um, accessory to a residential structure are considered to be minor activities under the Wetland Protection Act and under our local regulations. So they wouldn't have even needed a regulatory approval for this, but um, seeing as they have an open order of conditions and it's a change to the permit, um, they did notify us um, in writing to let us know that um, there was this minor change to their plan design. Thanks, Erin. Any questions, comments from commissioners? Okay. Um, Hello, okay. I have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Um, can you go, well, Aaron, can you go back to the slide? Of course. Uh, the uh, Hickory Ridge number and the Mill Lane number okay. are the same. Thank you. Let me make, make that correction right now. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. All right, with um, no further questions or comments, looking for a motion. I move to approve the minor administrative change to order of conditions DEP 089-0686. Second. I think, was that Andre on the second? Yep. Bruce on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an I. Alex, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Invasive. I mean, I'm sorry. I. <laughs> All right. Unanimous. Okay. All right. Um, one more minute. So maybe we'll just uh, mention that the Wildflower Drive Enforcement Compliance Update is uh, pending, rolling over. What do you want? Do you have a one minute? <laughs> Summary for us there, Aaron. 
Yeah, I did. Uh, at the last meeting, the commission basically set a deadline of them submitting their notice of intent by today. I reached out to the consultant and the landowner um, and the consultant, the wetland consultant basically let me know that they're still waiting on the surveyor to get out there. So they're they're trying to move it along, but they're, it's kind of out of their control um, to get the plan put together. So I know it's frustrating, um, but that's that's the information that was conveyed to me. And I did um, integrate the information from the consultant into your folder. Thanks, Erin. Could you just remind us what the potential timeline is for having that get in gear? I mean, after the violation occurred, I think the original deadline from the enforcement order was at the end of April. So, yeah. you know, does the, the surveyor have a expected date of availability? I guess no. Okay. Um. No, I. I don't even have a contact person for the surveyor. Um, it's been really, the communication's been really difficult and I've been trying. I think that now the the landowner has um, Goddard Engineering. So so Steve Riberty, who he's been doing quite a bit of work um, for others in town lately, he's been trying to help this landowner. So I think that that's at least somewhat encouraging that he has... Um, you know, retained a, a wetland person to help him. Um, and I'll continue to um, encourage them to move as quickly as they can and urge them to file as quickly as they can. But just feeling like they're, they're, they're trying to get the plan put together. They're just not, um, you know, they're held up by other things outside their control at this point. Okay. I guess I'll just trust that you keep an eye on that and some good it's good to know Steve Riberty is on the job too. Um, I guess knowing who their prospective surveyor is would probably be helpful as well. Bruce? I I went by there the other day and it didn't look like anything had happened for quite a long time. So at least it's stable. It's stasis <laughs> yeah. for now. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Moving on to our hearings. Um, all right, general procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda, five minutes from staff, five minutes from the presenter, five minutes for public comment or two per person, five minutes for conservation staff, uh, commissioners. Um, the commission requires all submitted and revised materials to be submitted by Wednesday the week prior to the meeting at close of business. And for all presenters and members of the public, please state your name, address of the project, who you're representing as well as preferred pronouns and from all members of the public, just clearly state your name and address and preferred pronouns. Okay, so first up is Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LSE Fornax LLC and WD Coles Inc. for the construction of a battery storage system, associated access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering Vegetated wetlands on Montague Road and Route 63, Map 2A, Lot 18. And Erin, I'll let you bring in any folks here for this one. Yes, so just bear with me while I promote folks. And if I'm missing anyone, please raise your hand, but I think I see everyone. Um, okay, I see uh, Sam, Scott, welcome. And I see an attendee hand up. Dana Steele, Erin? Yes and Jeffries. And I see, I there, was, see. there was a call in too, right? Um, yeah, and now there's a Kayla. Uh, Does okay. that sound right, guys? It's a big team. Kayla, there should be a call in, which is call in, and then Tim Kuhn also. Who is listed as Dana Steele. I'm here. Oh, okay. There you go, there you are. Okay, okay. well, welcome everybody. Okay, Aaron, do you want to give us the update, please? Before you start, yep. so Kayla, I need the last name, 
Colin, I need the last name. Do you want me to say yeah. spell it or is there a way to edit how I've presented it? It just says Kayla on the screen, so. I mean, if, if you can edit it and you know how to do that, that would probably be easiest for Bruce. But if you don't know how to immediately do that, just, just tell Bruce because he's our minute taker. <laughs> OK, um, do you mind if I just spell it out for you, Bruce? That's fine. OK, it's spelled K-E-R-I-A-Z as in zebra, E as in elephant. S as in Sam, Terry Aziz. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Colin. Uh, my last name is Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N. Thank you. How about Jeffries? Uh, Jeffrey Macel, M-A-C-E-L. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we're good then. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Go ahead, Aaron. So after our last meeting, um, there had been a number of comments, um, suggestions, and noted revisions that were needed to the plan set. Uh, the applicant did get all of those materials to us by last Wednesday. Um, we did have a site visit last Thursday. Um, several Conservation Commission members attended. Um, attendance was really great. We had a big group um, and basically walked the site. Um, Part of what I did was um, looking at the um, mitigation areas on the west side of the site, uh, which I took a lot of photos of and um, sort of did a quick, quick run through with Scott. Um, and then I think the other group looked at the areas that were further east. Um, I also looked at the um, wetland polygon, which had been previously delineated on the site. And I just wanted to have a look at that and see if there was soils and dominant wetland vegetation. Um, based on sort of my observations in the fields, I asked Jeff to add a small polygon, you know, and add the air, the small polygon to the plan, but basically note that, um, you know, we, we're not, sh there's no indication that there's, that there's um, wetland soils there and dominant wetland vegetation, but I did ask that that area be protected during construction with erosion controls and like some kind of construction fencing to keep it from getting damaged because my suspicion is that, that it was um, a more well-established wetland prior to the Eversource work taking place and that when the Eversource transmission line work took place, that the area was damaged. And so I think it's sort of just starting to reestablish itself. So I I don't think we could necessarily call it a, um, uh, a fully established wetland, but I wanna just leave it um, so that it stays in its current condition and not get damaged while this is being constructed. Um, I also drafted an order of conditions for the board. Um, there were some additional comments that were received, which haven't been incorporated yet, but um, there's a draft in the folder for us to start thinking about that. Thanks, Erin. Um, when you say draft in the folder, are you, you're speaking of the order of conditions that we're hoping to move forward tonight? Right. Or the and comments, okay. Yeah, and I um, I did get some feedback from the applicant. They didn't really have a whole lot of time to review the order of conditions. So, um, you know, whether they want to proceed on voting on that order of conditions or give it more time for them to review it, um, I will yield to them to make that decision and to you guys, but it's there for consideration. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, go ahead from... Karen Environmental, who would like to take the floor here. Great, yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, uh, thank you for the great site walk we had last week and thanks to, it was well attended. We really appreciate that. Um, specifically, um, we've made some minor modifications to the materials that were submitted on August um, 21st, a week ago. Uh, and with, some of the comments that we had received, we identified the polygon that uh, Aaron had mentioned, and it is noted on sheet three of uh, J.R. Russo's site plan. Uh, in addition, um, we had a 
some conversations during the field visit, which um, identified some modifications that could be made to the plan that was submitted uh, for the invasive plantings plan. So we can have Scott Smyers tonight talk a little bit about that. Um, specifically what we proposed in, as an update in the invasive uh, plant management and mitigation plan was to do a one time a year mow for the meadow type area. Um, and it would be a 1.37 acre area that has been identified uh, also in um, Tim Coon's civil plan, which would allow Scott to uh, Scott Smyers and Oxbow Associates to do some treatment of that area. And we think it would take the proposed 32 person hour um, uh, 32 person hours of work in the invasive plantings plan it would allow us to accomplish more with that um, and, and attack those polygons in a way that would um, hasten the uh, the removal of the invasives. Um, in addition, we submitted a, a stormwater and O&M plan last week. Um, that I did had done a number of the things that the commission had requested us to do. It identified the additional topography. It added the berm uphill on the uphill side of the driveway. It demonstrated our uh, adherence to the TSS and phosphorus removals with a proprietary separator. Um, it called out the cut and fill number for the unsuitables that would uh, be removed and the locations of where uh, a better structural soil could be added. It uh, pointed out the infiltration trench and its compliance with DEP best management practices and indicated how that would be accomplished through the vegetation and O&M plan that Tim Kuhn at J.R. Russo also provided. Um, we've added to the O&M plan the ongoing maintenance as well of the TSS and other stormwater features. Um, we've also got on the call, um, Kayla Kuritzis and uh, Colin Cannon, who can talk about any questions that uh, the commission may have around the best technical specifications, the battery energy storage system, technical specifications. Um, and we've submitted uh, some updated plans regarding um, the fire safety protocol. And at that site walk uh, last week, we also had uh, the commissioner um, and the fire safety. So commissioner Olmstead, or excuse me, chief Olmstead um, and fire safety officer, Chris Bascom were able to meet us on site and review the materials. Um, they're comfortable with access. Um, and the two things they requested from us were uh, a 12 foot right of way vegetation management so that they could ensure that trucks could get across that access and also um, that we plow the snow in the event of any snow events during the winter. So those two things um, have been added to our um, operations and maintenance plan and would be included with hazard mitigation analysis that we received a draft back from today, our third party provider, Spark, um, who is providing the hazard mitigation analysis in line with the fire safety application that we are uh, submitting. Um, we have all of our consultants on the, on the um, meeting tonight. So if there are specific questions with respect to any of the updates we've made to the plans, we're happy to dive into to that. Um, we're optimistic that we've comprehensively addressed the commission's questions and utilized best management practices for the work in the jurisdictional areas. Um, so let me give the commission and our professionals the opportunity here to, to engage a little more and, and answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you all being here tonight to answer those questions. Um, I know that several commissioners were on the site, so I'd like to hear from them, but uh, any commissioners that wanna have some questions or comments, please raise your hand. Okay, well, Alex, I might pick on you because I know that <laughs> you were there. Go ahead and please uh, let us know. I wanna, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for uh, 
the site visit and uh, it was informative and I appreciate uh, uh, that the invasive species polygons were mapped. And as I recall, the polygons are created to address our question about how big an issue is there. And um, as we were on site, it, we had a discussion about the fact that there are invasive species growing outside of those polygons. Uh, so the polygons don't necessarily represent all invasive species, but rather an indication of where they are particularly dense. And um, I noticed that in the plan, and, and frankly, I, um, I've been reading through the August 19 and the August 11 correspondence and, and then the order of conditions that Aaron has drafted and trying to put it all together. But what I see is that originally the proposal was to control invasive species on the entire lot. And what we seem to be now is to control invasive species up to 90% within polygons. And that seems to me to be a little bit going backwards from the original proposal and the 90% I'm not sure of control would be great, but um, to leave 10% bearing seeds um, is counterproductive. So I wonder if we couldn't work towards a more effective control that is not just limited to the polygons that were outlined to answer our question about how bad is it, and to talk instead of a percentage to, um, in order to um, avoid having to crawl around and look for things that are three feet, three inches tall, to try and make sure that nothing gets to seed bearing um, age. Um, and I'd also like to see the, <clears throat> I, Aaron, I looked through the conditions that you drafted and I had a hard time um, sort of seeing where their pro mitigated proposal was included. I'm sure it's there, but it just didn't seem to be highlighted. Um, and I'd like to see the conditions go to whoever is um, on the site. For example, if your company is sold or goes out of business and somebody else takes it up, that the responsibility goes to um, um, uh, the remainder. Uh, maybe that's in Aaron's order of conditions that she's drafted. I just didn't have time to track it down. So those are my my highlighted comments. Thanks, Alex. Um, so for that last one, I just I want to put that aside and just make sure that that's addressed, Aaron. Um, sort of the longevity of that, but um, in in regards to the polygons, maybe Scott, you could speak to the target areas versus the performance standards, and um, yeah, maybe clarify that, please. I think as I tried to, we tried to discuss it at the meeting, but the intent is still to get rid of the invasives, at, you know, west of the brook on the parcel, not just in the polygons. You know, we just map the densest ones just because it was taking. It was quite an effort to just make that map, and there would yeah. have been a lot more to map the smaller and smaller ones, the diminishing returns. Yeah. But the intent, the intent is to get rid of all the invasives on the site. Uh, we took your uh, recommendation, I think, or, or idea we had uh, discussed on the site walk about mowing, brush hogging, and then mowing in the future, uh, and and develop that more so i think that really will take care of a lot of the invasives over time because now we have not only the invasive monitoring and control <clears throat> with selective use of herbicides but also mowing what is it 1.3 acres somewhere around there um and then and then treating those areas with herbicides too so then you picture the buckthorn gets mowed it sprouts back up it's a small cluster leaves we can hit that the next year uh and then they can mow it again after the, it soaks in so it should should be more effective over time the combination of the mowing and the selective treatment uh it and and since it's a long-term management you know we, we we can 
see get as much done as we can the first year uh have the first mowing occur and then we still have plenty of hours to use the second year the third year the fourth year and we should require less and less hours but still be able to uh you know the 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 applicant the owner the project manager can budget that accordingly so we think it's a reasonable project that uh, or a schedule and and methods that that will achieve the goals that the conservation commission is looking for and and uh and be predictable for us uh, as the applicant and the applicant's team so if i could just you didn't address the 90 percent well we want to get it tonight i think i i I was on. Uh, I tried to get the point where we get to ninety percent, uh, you know, less than ten percent invasives, and we will report that every year to the conservation commission, right? And with a report, you know, well, just like anything else, wildlife, rare species, but also invasive plants. You know, that if the ten percent is scattered in very small amounts around the perimeter of the site, you know, maybe that's more difficult to to manage uh takes more time more effort if it's all clustered in one area that's easy to take care of but it'll depend on uh it, you know the, the the scenario in the field and we'll be reporting to the conservation commission and if the commission says okay well we don't think it's 10 percent. we think it's 15 percent. how'd you come up with 10 percent? let's go take a look you know then we'll do, deal with it one year at a time it's my idea just 10% is a pretty good, compared to what's out there now, that would be quite an achievement. Um, and, and, but but I think we will, you know, ultimately try to get to 0%. I think that's not completely, not impossible. Thanks, Scott. Um, so how are you measuring the percent? Are you doing transects for the site? Or like, what is the standardized measurement from year to year? Well, we'll start out with, we, we got the polygons that we have there now, right? So that's one start. But when we do the treatment this year, or whenever it's approved and where we can proceed, um, you know, we'll get more, more details at that point on treatment areas between the polygons. And so we'll have a more complete version. And then we can compare that to how it looks in the future. Yeah, but, you know, the way to do it, most accurately is with transects or plots, but I think with a project like this, it's 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 more of an estimate, and then double checking it with someone from like Aaron here from the Conservation Commission, saying this is this is what I think we're at with this whole area. I mean, you you could try to do it with you know, drones or things like that, you know that sort of thing, but I think GPS and estimating and eyeballing it is probably the be best way to go. Okay, I guess I do have concerns about that since we're setting a pretty solid number of 10% and sort of a perpetual uh, performance standard around that. And then there's gonna be your report and then us eyeballing it. And to say 10% without some way to measure it um, makes me a little uneasy. I guess I was thinking of a more standardized measurement. So just like running, some transects for the site and getting a site-wide evaluation that could be the same every year. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it might actually be more time intensive than what I was thinking of. Um, so I'm trying to think of a way to get a, okay. So it sounds like to me that you're going to go out and measure the 10% based on the polygons and you're going to go look at the polygons and you're going to say, are they 10% invasive or are they not every single year? Um, I guess that sounds like a lot of more work than I was anticipating, but well, I well, see I mean, they, yeah. The the whole site and then the polygons represent part of the site, right? You know, so I wouldn't necessarily be going in each polygon and measuring 10% of that polygon, 10% of that. It's just okay, we got rid of everything in in let let's say six of the polygons. That's good, but over in this corner, it's not as good. So let's look more carefully at what we had to look at before. And to be honest with, you know, my experience with these sorts of things, you know, you, it's obvious when you make a good dent in the invasive plants after a couple of years, you're really lowering it down. And then oftentimes I will present something to the Conservation Commission and say, 
uh, you know, I think we're at that threshold, whatever the threshold is that we agreed on. Uh, I think we're at it or close to it. And a lot of times by that time, they're just so sick of it. They just say, okay, it's fine. You know, it's good. <laughs> you know, they've been out there. They've seen you made a lot of progress on it. It's never going to be perfect, you know, but this is, yeah. this okay. has got a few different species on it. So I'm just saying how, just telling you how it works in the real world. Sometimes I know you're trying to come up with something predictable and we could do transex. We can do whatever you want. You know, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm fine with it. We're fine with that. Sure. Okay. Well, the one more thing I'll say before I give the floor to Dave and Aaron, um, I want this to be an adaptive invasive plan because one of the things that I know was brought up was the potential introduction of knotweed onto the site from the construction vehicles and just the general disturbance. So I know that you've um, very well outlined the the worst of invasives, most prevalent ones there, but I just want to be clear that when we talk about 10% invasive species that it goes beyond the current target species so that if you're targeting those but then there isn't a knotweed invasion then we're moving on towards towards that so in that case it's you know adapted to the current problem and that's probably going to change and morph as time goes on so i just i don't want to limit us to what's currently there and what's currently the problem, because I'm sure you'll do a very good job in controlling those. But once you do that, something else will have the opportunity to pop up. So um, that's just one point I wanted to make. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, um, I have not been as involved in this application as as many others on the call, but, but I have been at most of the meetings where um, this team has presented. And I guess I just wanted to put this a little bit in context that um, from my from my perspective, you know, the applicant and the consulting team they put together has come a tremendously long way from the first presentation on this project, on the mitigation plan. Um, I, I just want to caution the commission a little bit on, on kind of consistency and is is this the the level of of um, of scrutiny and or and or detail that we give every proposal that comes before the commission? I think ninety percent reduction in invasives is is an is 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 a lofty goal for any applicant, and I think we just need to be a, a realistic uh, in in what uh, they are proposing to be done out there, and I guess. I'm just putting that forth. I, I think they have put forth a an excellent plan with an excellent mitigation approach. And I just I I I would like to see the applicant, you know, move as quickly through our processes as possible. I, I think where they where they started from and where they are today is light years ahead of of where they were some months ago. So those were my my only comments. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. I agree. This is a good plan. I guess just to be clear, we're not looking for a 90% reduction in invasives. We're just looking to maintain a 10% prevalence of invasives. So I don't actually know what the what the prevalence is now, but we're just looking to maintain or get to a 10%. So, I mean, when I'm talking about having some standardized way to do it, like the point at which you guys stop and are then relinquished from doing this any further is at 10%. So for you to say that and for us to agree, it would be good to just know how we're both going to measure it. So yeah. if you guys can just say something and we can go out there and say, yep, I did it. I see it. I agree. Rather than some subjectiveness, I think that would get us to the to the end point much quicker in a less subjective way. That's just my point on that. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I was going to actually, I'm looking back at the notes from the last time that Lodestar was in front of us and I really support what Dave said. I think in, in terms of what we outlined uh, them to address, I think they've actually gone above and beyond. Um, so, uh, which actually is um, not, which is not uh, uh, typical necessarily um, in the course of our commission meeting. So um, invasive species plan, stormwater management, redesign of the system. Um, I'm going back and looking at all these notes. So I was not on site. Um, however, in, in terms of what's been submitted, I think, um, you know, I'm going to vote in, in favor of, of moving this project along. Thanks, Laura. Alex? Yeah, I, um, 
I want to comment on on Dave's um, advice to the commission as director of conservation. In that project has moved along because commissioners took an interest to do their job. From what it was originally proposed, it only moved because commissioners looked at it hard, provided comments and feedback, and did our job. If we had not done that, it would be a very different story. And we have a project which is right at the 50 foot mark. We have a project which is inside the 75 foot mark. We have a project that sets precedent, which we've talked about in the past. And invasive species control was their idea, not ours. So while I appreciate your counsel to the commission, I would appreciate it if you would let us do our job. Thanks, Alex. Laura? Yeah, well, I think we should take this discussion offline and move with the hearing because I, I don't, yeah I, yeah, I think everyone's doing their best. I think we're just responding to the fact that the applicant has provided thorough materials um, and uh, everyone, there's no argument that everyone's putting in time here. Um, but there is a lot longer history, you know. Anyways, let's let's keep the discussion going. I'm sorry, Andre. Yeah, I'd like to uh, echo uh, Dave's mention earlier about the uh, the amount of effort uh, put in by everybody, um, the applicants as well as the commissioners, as uh, Alex is stating. Um, the way that everything is uh, set right now, I'm ready to uh, to vote for uh, uh, to vote for approval. But um, I do think that it's important to have um, to have your work, meaning the applicant's work, be measurable. Um, so I'm sure that there's something easy that can be done so that we can. Um, you know, if you say, look, we took care of 90% of uh, the invasives, we can look at it. It's, it's just exactly what, uh, uh, what Michelle was saying. We can look and measure it, and we would both, you guys and the commission, would agree, yeah, that's right. That's according to the standards that we set up. And I think that's a pretty easy solution. Um, and if you don't believe so, I'd like to hear uh, back from you folks. But um, yeah, I'm ready to I'm ready to move if we can find a way to measure it. Thanks, Andre. And and just to clarify again, we're not looking for ninety percent reduction. We're looking for ten percent prevalence. So the difference is whatever is there, reducing it by ninety percent. That's not what we're doing. We're looking at the entire site and we're saying only ten percent is covered by invasives. And I think that's how it's worded right now in all of the documentation. So if I'm wrong, Scott, please let me know, but um, go ahead and respond to those commissioner comments. Yeah, thanks. I just want to, I, I don't know why I didn't say this earlier, but I think what we should do with the 10% is just, uh, you maybe you could put a condition that says something like that the 10% threshold will be informed by GPS mapping of the invasive plants. So in other words, when it, we map the invasive plants as a as during like a monitoring visit before we get ready for the you know the, we don't necessarily like right now we we know where they are then we treat it in year one then the next year we go out then we map what's left over right and we can give that as part of our report for that year and that'll give us a okay then we can divide that by the area of the entire lot and then we get what percentage are we at, right? We just do that over and over again until we get to 10%. So we can just use GPS mapping. Sometimes it'll be a little bit confusing because it might be a larger area, smaller areas, but we can do all the calculation. Sometimes it might be a lot of pinpoints and maybe we can decide at that point if we want to, uh, how we want to count those. But I don't know if any, I'm sure you've all looked at or a lot of you looked at Munsell soil charts when you're evaluating wetlands. They have these right at the beginning of it, you know, percent cover of the redoxomorphic features. It's like the scatter plot and a square.
but it's the same sort of thing. It says 5%, 10%, you know, we're going to have, we're going to result in something like that. So I suggest GPS mapping and pr providing that to the conservation commission to give you something quantifiable to make your judgments on. Does that sound great. Good? Yeah, that sounds good. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Can you clarify as far as the 10% threshold then is the intention to reduce the invasive species until there's only 10% remaining and then stop or, you know, so if you do this in year two and you get to 10%, are you done or what is the time threshold to reach this 10% or is it just consistently ongoing for 20 years? I th maintaining I think that 20, yeah. uh, maintaining that 10%. So as written, once they reach 10%, they're basically done with their mitigation treatment. Well, I thought it was until it, it then if it, if it goes above 10%, then we got to come back if we're still in that time period. Okay. So what is the yeah. time period just to remind us? 20 years. Okay. That's actually 30 years. Okay. 30 years. I mean, 30 that years. is um, great. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so if we're having a 30 year plan, I mean, where you're effectively getting to and then maintaining 10%. I think we have plenty of time then, you know, to work out the finer points and the finer details of exactly how we're measuring that year over year. Yeah. I mean, probably best uh, resolved in the beginning, but um, if we need to revisit it because people aren't seeing the same thing or, you know, there's better ways to do it. I think that's fine to bring back to the commission in year two or three. Um, go ahead, Alex. I'd like to see us stay away from uh, disagreeing as we go into the future and think about you know, 30 years is a long time. I will not be on the commission for most of that 30 years, nor will anybody here. Dave Zomack won't be with us over that entire period. And I would like to see us develop something that is pretty clear. And I, I, I'm not sure we have a plan in front of us that does that. Um, I would like to see something that's so easy to understand that if there was a commission with all new people and there was nobody with any memory, the written document would speak for itself and keep us away from arguing. Um, so that we don't have to roll up our sleeves and spend a lot of energy on this project year after year after year, but that it becomes pretty clear that they've either done what they're supposed to do or they're not. And I'm not quite sure we're there. I mean, I agree with you, Alex, and I'm sort of partial to having some kind of um, agreed measurable way to to do this since it's going to be 30 years, just so we can get this straight off the bat. It sounds like Scott, that you have sort of a model that you could present um, and we could all look at and agree upon. And then that could be the point at which we're agreeing for 30 years to come. So we don't all have that in front of us right now, but I think something visual, measurable, um, objective would be really helpful because that, 10% um, for the next 30 years is going to be a lot of money and a lot of effort on everybody's end. And to be clear about what's going on is probably in everyone's best interest. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, I think it's important that whatever the mechanism is, take into account the possibility that sometime, maybe sooner than later, that the um, herbicides will be banned and it'll require some other technique to get to whatever the 10% or whatever the percentage is. Yeah, well, that I guess is in sort of their wheelhouse to determine how they treat it and not part of our order of conditions, right? I mean, if it is, I would like to allow the flexibility for them to treat it as they need to. Go ahead, Laura. Um, I'm, and this is more of a question for Aaron, I think. Um, actually, I guess to the commission as a whole, uh, too, but are we suggesting that we're not going to issue the order of conditions tonight and instead ask them to come back again with a plan for measuring the invasives? Is there not an alternative where we can, um, it sounded as though Scott had some ideas right now, but 
you know, Aaron, is there a scenario we can, where we can where we can offer or uh, to approve that the oil order of conditions with, you know, the expectation that there'll be um uh quantitative plan for measuring invasives in the future submitted? I mean, I, I think that the idea of including a condition that with the monitoring report um, for the mitigation plan that the um, area of the invasives be mapped is really the most accurate that we can get. Um, if we can locate them and approximate their area based mm -hmm. on the entire parcel size, that's going to be a pretty accurate measurement of the the area of the infestation. So I think that that's a a solid sure. suggestion, and I think that that could be easily added. Um, I mean, okay. I'd like I would like a methodology. I'm just gonna say that because pinpoints on a map, we're talking about like what, how many acres of this? Like, how are we gonna add up this and say it's the amount? of total coverage on a site. We just we just need, and it's totally available, and Scott, I'm sure you have a great idea to do this, but we just need that, and we just need to agree upon it. And I, I, I think this is important enough that we don't have to like fiddle around with it and say, is this a polygon? Is it a point? How much area is this? Is this one plant? Is it a cluster? I don't, I don't even want to deal with that. I just want to say, this was a methodology and this is how it adds up and it's 10% or it's not 10%. So there's so many ways to do this and we just need something in front of us so that we can all agree on it to move forward. And it's such a long-term process that I think it's worth even just going another two weeks if we have to, to approve this, to have something in front of us that's quantitative. Go ahead, Bruce. Nope, okay, Alex. Yeah, they're on a whole kind of a different subject, and I'll turn my camera on. Um, there was discussion about the fact that Eversource has a right of way. And I'm sorry, I'm having trouble turning my camera. Alex, we can't hear you. Yeah, okay. you're showing muted right now, and before you, you didn't, I think what you did with your camera has uh, muted you. Okay, you're going to get so. take a time out. Um, so I have no doubt that Scott could come to us with a methodology like we've been requesting, and so I'd be willing to move forward with this if there's some mechanism that we could somehow post, post uh, motion approve that. But I just think we need something um, that's quantitative enough for any commission to look at a map, to look at the numbers, and it's just not fuzzy. Um, so, Aaron, if this is much more specific than we normally give towards like post motion um, approvals, but if you have a suggestion for how to for how to do that so that it would be contingent upon maybe some circulation of the methodology to the commission. But the, but the methodology couldn't just be to, uh, before each year's uh, treatment that uh, Oxbow would map the uh, invasive, uh, the remaining invasive plant clusters with GPS and provide that map to uh, the Conservation Commission with calculations of the areas of each of the patches of invasive plants with photographs. You know, I mean, I think that would be the method, which is, I think, already described in our re report, but you could clarify it to your satisfaction as a condition, uh, it, it, you know, a, a simple condition, I think. Okay, so just to give some context to this, if we take the current map that you have, you're currently saying that the entire polygons that you have right now are in infestations. And so adding that area wise up over the entire parcel equals the amount of invasive coverage on the site. And that those will 
progressively shrink ideally with treatment and we're adding up the areas of polygons within the entire parcel so right. you're mapping okay and so but you're not mapping individual plants so you're really mapping clusters so we're we're focusing on invasive cluster like target areas yeah and we're missing we're, we're obviously based on our field walk last week we're missing some small a lot of the smaller patches so we could go and map all those too but you know we're going to treat all those in this first year and it doesn't really matter if the 10 percent is the whole site not just 90 percent less so yeah i, I mean i'm comfortable with that kind of polygon mapping as long as we have some definitions around what your invasives are that you're targeting like i understand there is maybe some loose stray plants out there that weren't put in um right. just that at what point you know one plant of knotweed might not get mapped in year two but in year three it might be a cluster so right yeah, yeah. um well, we'll we'll describe all that, and it'll be okay. reviewed by the commission each time. You know. Okay. So to so then to describe it quantitatively, you're going to map the polygon clusters of invasive plants and focusing on your target and clustered areas, but you're going to be noting like point locations, mm -hmm. which could then be visited by a conservation commissioner, Aaron. Okay, commissioners, does that sound okay as a path forward for some kind of quantitative mapping, which will be in place for 30 years unless revisited as otherwise by another commission? Alex. Still muted, Alex. Erin, you had your hand up. Do you want to say something while we... I think the commission should make a decision if you're going to close the hearing tonight. Um maybe get a read from the applicants where things stand with issuance of the order, um, if they want more of an opportunity to review the order before it's issued. And then we should make a decision to move on to the next hearing because we've spent over 45 minutes on this hearing and we have five more hearings tonight. And um, if we can't come to a re resolution tonight, I think we need to continue. Um, but if, if the, you know, we could either close the public hearing and then resolve the methodology wording um, to incorporate that as a condition that we could then review and approve at the next meeting to actually issue the order, or you could continue request methodology, to, written methodology to be submitted to us, but I think we just need to one way or another be fair to the remaining folks who are on the call waiting for their hearing. Alex, are you with us again? I think I have a microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about how we calculate, how we work in the Eversource right away. When we were in the field, we had a discussion about the fact that they maintain the vegetation in the right away. And it wasn't quite clear if, if this project could work inside the right away. Um, and so I ask, well, they've calculated the area in the lot to be 47,391 square feet. I think that's what that number represents. And is that with or without the Eversource right-of-way? If it includes the right-of-way, maybe we should take the right-of-way out if you cannot uh, work on it. Can anyone answer that? Yeah, so the proposed area of work uh, is approximately 5,000 square feet. The polygons that were mapped by uh, by Scott uh, are 47,391, and that is correct. So there's a, a one to um, 60.06 uh, ratio of area of proposed work to mitigation area. If we include the entire six acres, it's one to 245. Um, what Scott's plan has proposed is to start with treatment of invasives within the 47,391 square feet and successively with each year using 32 human hours 
hopefully successfully treat the 47,000 square feet, but also look beyond with those hours. And if in one year treating the 47,391 square feet, he's only done that in four, six, eight hours, he has additional time to spend outside looking for migration of invasives outside of those polygons. So the entire six acres has been proposed as the area, but with some capped limit of human hours that would get spent um, at 32 human hours. So uh, I think that's a dynamic that's important to understand and what is proposed in that plan is that we are not just looking at the polygons as the treatment area, but as the starting point with the most dense populations and then moving beyond the polygons as time permits. Um, Specifically, Alex, your comments in the field were very good. We incorporated this mowing area because we think the 32 hours will go further with the 1.37 acres of mowed area. And so those polygons will not only be able to treat the polygons, but also look for further migration on the six acres. Yeah, I thought the mowing was great. Great. That was a great addition. Thank you for that. Uh, I, yeah, um, still, I would just. Sorry, I'm still concerned about the Eversource right away. And because uh, I think what you said is you can't work in there right away. So, yeah, I, I forgot to address that point. So they have a non-exclusive easement in that area. So we have the right to do work there, but we can't control their use of the easement. So if they want to spray, they can spray. If we want to spray, we can spray as long as we're not interfering with their use. So, you know, we can't interfere with the towers. We can't interfere with their roadways. Um, but if we are, you know, cutting, spraying, mechanically removing whatever we need to do or Scott's team needs to do, that can be done. It just can't interfere with their work. And as we saw, they're out there doing some spraying already. Um, and I don't think that's, you know, the treatment we're targeting. We're looking for really, you know, mechanical removal or, or, or cut and limited spray, but um, we can coexist in that space, but it is a non-exclusive area for us to work. Okay, and uh, Chair, there is a whole other part of this plan that involves planting, and we haven't even talked about that, and it's fairly fuzzy in the way it's produced, so the way it's represented. So I, I favor them providing a document that is a little clearer so that a different board would have no problem understanding what's supposed to be happening out there in year 10, 15, 20, and so on. Okay. Um, before I forget, can we please add language that there shouldn't be any mowing if there's not weed infestation? So that would have to be something that's monitored and adjusted for. Um, I definitely don't want to go down that road. Um, yes, we haven't gone to the planting. I generally consider that to be a, a beneficial thing. I'm not sure I had more questions upon that. Um, I personally am in favor of moving this forward on the condition that we maybe Scott can provide us some more language um, after the meeting about just the methodology in the quantitative um, in a more quantitative way about how we're going to measure and assess that 10 percent each year over the years. Um, and then after that, um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. And I just want to see a show of hands from the commissioners who is in favor of moving this forward tonight with some further clarification of the invasive management plan. I can't see you, Alex, but I'm seeing a majority of hands. So I'm seeing that we can go to our order of conditions, Erin. I am acknowledging that Rachel submitted some comments that we haven't discussed, but hopefully were reviewed and she's not here to represent tonight, but I did not have a chance to review that. I have not incorporated Rachel's comments yet. I just simply did not have time to do it um, in my draft order. So would it make sense for us to close the public hearing and refine the order of conditions and then issue at the next meeting, issue the order? I think so, yes. Okay. So, okay. I mean, it's as simple as us just making a motion to just close the public hearing, and then we can refine the order of conditions, the, the final detail of that um, at the next meeting. Okay. I'm not seeing any public comment, period. And so um, let's... 
move to close the public hearing for Karen environmental I, go ahead I'll move to close the public hearing issue order of conditions DEP number 089-0731 with standard boilerplate conditions with the addition of um, clarification for the invasive species quantification methodology to come after the fact under both the Maryland Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional conditions. I second that. Okay, so did you just motion for us to issue the order of conditions or... Okay, is that what you had just suggested, Aaron? I thought we were just closing the public meeting. Yeah, um, that I think Jason might have misunderstood, but that's okay. So, so the motion is there. So, if we're not going to okay. pass it tonight, then we could just vote that down and make another motion to, or okay. he could withdraw his motion. And we there's just a, motion a motion on the table to issue an order of conditions tonight. Um, are there any commissioner comments to fo following that? Um, initially, we had proposed to just close the public hearing. I will withdraw my motion and I will move to close the public hearing. And. OK, so now there's a new motion on the table to close the public hearing. I'll second that. Bruce on the second, Jason on the motion. Jason. When, when do we have discussion about this? Is that now or later? Okay, yes, I can open it for discussion. I, I'm a little confused. What does it actually mean to close the hearing while something gets decided and the order of conditions gets modified? Um, we're not going to meet until the next meeting, so we will have a new order of conditions to review for the next meeting, will we have opportunity to comment on it, change it, or is it a done deal? Yeah, we would. So it's just the hearing is closed, so there's no more public comment on it. So you, the board, then without the applicant, without without the public, would then um, they could, the board can modify it, the board can add conditions, the board can change conditions at the next meeting before they issue the order, but uh, the hearing is closed. So that means there's no more sort of public testimony on the hearing. Um, but certainly between now and that meeting, I could work with Jeff's team to, you know, make sure that they're, they're comfortable with the order um, that comes to you for a vote. Just, just to be clear, what I understood the conversation just was we were just about ready to vote on an order of conditions, but we did not incorporate Rachel's feedback. So and like the, the goal of the next meeting then is to have basically everything we discussed today, including Rachel's items, and then to approve this. What, what I want to avoid is another massive discussion, recounting everything we just said tonight. Um, so that's, that's my understanding of, of what we determined tonight. Am, am I correct? Correct. Okay. Right. We'd roll in Rachel's comments and the other conditions that have been discussed tonight. Okay. So we have a motion. I think we have a second. Um, I'm going to take roll. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. Jason. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, sorry we didn't get closed out, but it looks like we're very, very close. So thanks, Scott, for feeling questions tonight. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye Jeff. Yeah, you guys have put together a really good package there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next up, hearing two, EBT, I'm opening this one. 
This hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a amended notice of intent for EBT Environmental Consultants, Inc. on behalf of Amad Amhad Con Development Corp for proposed directional drilling associated with the installation of a water line under bordering vegetated wetland at 23 and 28 green leaves map 13D lot 79 and 80. Erin, update, please. Yes. So the commission issued this order of conditions, I want to say back in 2022. Um, it was for the um, installation of a water line connection between two buildings at the green leaves uh, retirement community. They did some exploration um, of the proposed waterline location and determined that the there's a sewer line that would run right beside it, which is a rather old sewer line. And the DPW was concerned that installation of the waterline could damage the sewer line. And so they asked um, Green Leaves to come up with an alternative location for the water line. So rather than trenching the entire line between the two buildings and the wetlands, they've come up with a plan to do directional drilling, basically directly between the two buildings, which means that they um, use a, a directional underground drill. Um, it's like 14 feet below the wetland to install um, uh, a pipe, which would connect the water between the two buildings. All of the spoils from the drillings um, would go into a dumpster and be taken off site. So there wouldn't be any um, stockpiling or dewatering or anything like that done on site to deal with it. All other factors of the plan would remain the same with the exception of no trench, just underground drilling. Based on my comments, it's a significant reduction in the amount of impact, the amount of surface excavation for the install. Um, and Glenn Kravosky is on the is on, and I'm going to promote him to panelist so that he can have an opportunity if he has anything to add. But I th am pretty sure he is um, also <laughs> attending two hearings tonight, so I'm not sure how much he'll be able to talk. But I'm going to attempt to promote him to talk. Oh, and somebody else is raising their hand, so I'm going to allow them to talk as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Zach Less from Existing Grade, the uh, design engineer for this project. Um, so I, I, I can kind of speak to what's going on here and answer any questions the commission may have. Uh, again, as, as you had stated, Aaron, um, the original intent in, in why this project was before the commission uh, back at the beginning of the year was for a parking lot for 28 leaves. It was a previously approved a uh, project a while ago, and, and we were back before the commission to re-permit it uh, with all the stormwater management and such. And part of that was the installation of a new water line. It was going to be running along the south side of the project, kind of up a existing access way. Um, and as it stated, the DPW had concerns with trenching along an existing sewer line that would have, you know, potentially compromised that line. So the intent would be to do directional drilling underneath the wetlands. It'd be about approximately 500 feet. Um, the owner has been working with JS Ray, who this is kind of their specialty in doing these types of installations. Um, it'd be an eight inch water line that would get drilled underneath the wetlands. So there'd be no immediate service impact to those wetlands. There's kind of two pits on each side of the wetlands where they're able to start the drill and then you're able to pop it out on the other side without having any sort of surface disturbance and those pits can kind of act as a sump for any sort of the spoils and, and um, you know, drilling fluid, which is mainly water. They pump that out and remove it from the site. So there's, there's more or less no impact to the wetlands for the installation of this line, but it does mitigate the concerns that the DPW had in regards to that sewer line. Thanks, Zach. Um... Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll take commissioner comments. Bruce, go ahead. Uh, name and address for the phone. So could you... Suzanne Munchen. Okay. Oh, sorry. You say it again. Go ahead, Suzanne. Yes, I'm here. 
I thought you were asking if I was here. I am here. But the doctor's going to talk. The name, your name and address, please. Suzanne Munchen. I work at 27 Greenleaf Drive, Amherst, Mass. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, any commissioner questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I mean, I understand this is less impact than we initially permitted it for, so that's great. It seems fairly straightforward. So um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. Seeing none, looking for a motion. I move to close the public hearing and issue the amended order of conditions DEP, DEP number 089-0711 with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Mass Wetlands Protection Act and the Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, parens article 3.31 and regulations, close parens comma, with the noted additional conditions. Second. Second. I have Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Um, thank you, Zachary and Susan. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Have good night. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is notice of intent for SWCA on behalf of University of Massachusetts for an after the fact notice of intent application for the construction of a pavilion and associated site work on Orchard Hill Residential Area 152. Orchard Hill Drive. The project includes work within the 100 foot buffer to bordering vegetated wetlands and within the Amherst jurisdictional waterway. I see Meredith and Jason. Welcome. Um, Good evening. Anyone else? You're on mute, Aaron. If anybody else needs to be added as a panelist, I've tried to add everybody um, that I recognize, but I'm not sure if everybody oh, wants no, to be yeah. added in or I, not. No, Meredith and I can handle that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, why don't you give us our five minute update, please? Yes. So um, I've met with UMass on several occasions since the last hearing. Um, they have revised the um, road crossing to be larger, a larger sized pipe um, for the access road into the pavilion site. Um, and I've, you know, requested that they submit to us um, like an O&M plan in association with that because there are some down gradient stormwater structures and they have stormwater structures that are associated with the pavilion. So they did provide the O&M plan in association with that as requested. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they've submitted to me what I was looking for um, in terms of revisions and documentation on the project. So I'm prepared to recommend the commission to um, issue the order of conditions tonight. Um, so I'll yield the rest of my time to Jason and Meredith. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to see you again, commission. We uh, It's been uh, a month and a half or so since we last met with you. Uh, thank you again for having us. Um, we have uh, further design, and uh, as Aaron mentioned, uh, met multiple times in regard to like the design itself. But last time we met, we actually had a lot of conversation that was um, regarding like the SWIP and the site management. Um, and we wanted to address some of those issues with you because that was uh, you know, a lot of our conversation. We had tech issues last time, I don't know if you recall, but we were not able to present with um, the new Zoom update that had happened. So we weren't able to present. So most of our time was spent in regard to the site management and the SWIP issues. So we wanted to address that. So one of the big features is uh, not in addition to Meredith presenting on the on behalf of the university in regard to the notice of intent itself, we also have uh, SWCA is hired as a third party for the script management slash investigations that we have. So that's good because we've we've made great improvements on the site. Um, the contractor has you know been challenged with the regard to the fact that there's a large site. Is a large cross slope, and we were all, I think all of us discussed that all last time when we were all in agreement that was a difficult site for them to manage. They've made great improvements. So 
Um, in addition to not only presenting the NOI, we have Meredith also presenting the NOI, um, excuse me, the SWIP updates in regard to inspections and stuff. I think she can speak to that. So for site and soil management in regard to like the overall site. And then if, what we really have to get to is we really haven't really talked about the crossing itself, which Erin represented, you know, that we've discussed with her multiple times. I don't think this group has really ever saw that. So we're really looking forward to getting to that. So uh, Meredith, you now please take it away. Thank you. Good to see you all again. Thanks. I'll try to be fast. I know we're well into the meeting time. Let me see if I can. I just put together a little PowerPoint. Um, can folks see my screen? Yep. Just we a PowerPoint. Okay, yep. thanks. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, recap what's been done as far as the SWIP and just let everyone know that um, a lot of people have been working very hard on this project and these are all the um, people that have been involved and, you know, I'm SWCA, Meredith Bornstein, Wetlands Consultant. Um, obviously, Jason is here from UMass and they're from, and Kim jaworski Bruski is also um, managing this project from the UMass Facilities Department. Um, architect of record or Sigurd Miller, Palan Studio. Um, Terry, oops, hey, I can't click on that. Um, Terry Willico is the UMass Environmental Health and Safety person um, that's been involved in this project. Niche Engineering, they're not here tonight, um, but they did do the crossing design and the um, stormwater calculations um, that we'll talk about in a second with the culvert design. Um, Stimson Studios are there are landscape architects who did the design of the whole project, um, the landscaping. And Suffolk is um, the site contractor. They're on site right now, and they've been doing the SWIP inspections. And SBCA has been doing third-party um, SWIP inspections as well. Um, and then OTO is a licensed site professional and geotechnical engineer. Um, I just want people to know that early in the design phase, the project team hired licensed site professionals um, as part of their due diligence on how to manage soils at the site. So OTO is a licensed site professional, also referred to as an LSP. Um, they had several recommendations that were implemented during the initial phase of construction. Um, and all that work was completed and consistent with the applicable regulatory requirements um, as part of the soil management at the site. So they also filed a SWIP, oops, um, and the SWIP was filed with the EPA. It was stored on site. They were doing inspections. Um, they needed a little more help with getting the site under control because it was such a big area exposed all at once. And we did get some really severe weather um, at the beginning of the summer. Um, this is just a map showing the general area. Um, I just wanted to orient folks to Orchard Hill part of campus. Eastman Lane um, is on the north side. Um, and Orchard Hill living areas over here on the um, south side. There are wetlands in the woods um, over on the east side. The pear trail, as we refer to it, is an existing kind of walkway. Um, and there are associated stormwater basins um, affiliated with that. It was actually an electrical duct bank project that filed a notice of intent for back in 2015. And we did have an order for those basins. Um, so um, just to orient folks to the site. So um, let's see, I just want to update you. So we had a lot of discussion on the SWIP. This area is the electrical duct bank that was, um, so the utilities at the site tied into the existing electrical duct bank. And this is an area in the buffer zone, a photo, oops, from July, and then a photo from August um, 19th, and it's establishing really well. Um, and actually it's so well vegetated, it probably the erosion controls can come out at some point after we file a certificate of compliance. But just to show folks that that area is doing well, this was another area that they had trouble with. Um, photo on the left from July, photo on the right um, from August 19th, and you can see it's the vegetation is coming in nicely. And um, I will say the site is stable overall. Let's see, this is in some photos of the North Slope. If you remember the folks who did the site visit, it was a 
big area that was exposed. Um, they, after we met in July 10th, they um, installed a bunch of different erosion and sedimentation controls, such as check dams, stone check dams, earthen check dams, um, temporary basins. They have since, um, oh, and erosion control blanket, which I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then this is new loom and this has all been hydro seeded. So as of yes, shoot, sorry, you guys, um, yesterday, the site has been, this is a photo on the right from yesterday and, um, vegetation is coming in on that North slope and it's looking really well. They did hydro seed, but they still have work to do. And there are temporary basins, um, throughout the site still. Um, and so, yes, the erosion control blankets, we, Right after the meeting we had on July 10th, the contractor was out there installing erosion control blankets. Unfortunately, they used photodegradable rather than completely biodegradable um, blankets. And we got the word from the commission and you know, UMass doesn't like um, photodegradable blankets anyways either. So they have subsequently removed all the photodegradable blanket from the site and it didn't need, um, the photo on the right is the same area. Um, adjacent to the pear trail, it didn't need another blanket. The vegetation's coming in very nicely over there. So just so folks are aware um, about the blankets that were used. This is just a photo um, from July and August of the basin where turbid water had left and entered into the buffer zone, which is an existing stormwater basin. So luckily the basin was there, nothing has entered wetland resources and um, this area, the photo on the right, um, the water was completely kind of gone by then, but um, you know, it continues to hold water and these need to be maintained as part of the closeout of this project. And I just want to show, so now we'll get into the design um, of the crossing. I flagged a small bordering vegetative wetland on the um, Northwest side of the existing parking lot underneath the solar panels and um, and a little stream channel leaving that um, BBW. So we have designed the crossing. Um, this is just a zoomed in version of um, that area. So you can see the wetland flags on the plan, a little stream leaving and then entering. There's a culvert here. This is the driveway um, running north and south. Um, it's gonna be porous pavement with um, adjacent reinforced turf. Um, the crossing will be about 33 feet long. It's, it will be an elliptical pipe. Um, it's 14 inches wide and 23 inches tall. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and it does actually meet the 1.2 times being full with stream channel um, requirement because it, the channel is about one foot wide. Um, oh, and so as part of this plan, we're going to formalize the area and we are going to install um, wetland plantings on either side of the stream. Um, we're not touching the wetland um, and we're leaving that as is. Um, and we're going to um, install river rock to make sure there's no erosion because the solar panels also um, drip down and um, erode that area a little bit. So it, we're gonna install rounded stone to formalize the channel and ferns adjacent to it on both sides of the crossing. And um, I think this will be a nice way to formalize the area and um, preserve it in perpetuity. perpetuity. So um, I think, yeah, that's all I have. I don't know if Jason has other stuff he wants to share um i know that was a lot and i was trying to go quickly so no you, yeah trying to get the time yeah um i'm I gonna know. take commissioner comments now thanks jason go ahead bruce well i was at the site visit the, the july 8th photo show so i really appreciate seeing the the progress that's been made visually in each of those problematic areas that we visited that day thank you Ms. bruce jason Meredith, you mentioned uh, reinforcing the turf that's going to be there at the crossing. How are you going to be reinforcing that? Was that the rock or is there some other method by which you're going to be reinforcing that turf? I, I may have misspoke. It's reinforced turf. So I think it's rock and then turf on top. 
Is that correct, Jason? That's correct. So, um, so our idea is that we, um, we so this is, uh, you guys have faced this also, I'm sure, but it's a fire code, you know, and a PA fire code that we want a 20 foot lane for fire lane access. So we don't want to have a 20 foot wide concrete or asphalt swath. So what we were going with is a 10 foot wide permeable asphalt. And on each side of that is a buffer of five feet to allowing the total dimension to be 20 feet. That reinforced turf allows like infiltration. It's it's basically a reinforced turf that allows um, it to be mowed. It's going to be maintained. Um, it's where it's the, the structure itself is not going to be like we don't like the aesthetic of like having um, you know concrete membranes that are going to kind of show through. So our our goal is to have it be very feel narrow in aesthetic, but uh, accessible via like NFPA. So that's that's the goal. Reinforced turf means that's like it's drivable, navigable by a fire truck. But it's really a tempo wide permeable asphalt is the main aesthetic that most people will see. And that's going over the pipe? Correct. That whole assembly is over the culvert, correct? From the and north sorry. end of the parking lot. Okay. And I'm just I'm not I'm not clear what when you say the reinforced turf, what on the, the two five foot stretches on each side, that's going to be turf grass over rock? uh mostly grass like the it's basically going to be like a it's it's a terrain system that has allowed that's like it's it's earthen ground as in that this turf growing through it um mowed down low similar to some of the um paths that we're going to have uh assembling to this site that are going to allow pedestrian access to it that are it's in grass areas mowed very low that even though it's across grass terrain will be navigable by people this one's going to be navigable by fire trucks um, and a PA allows us to have it be that they need 20 feet to get in there uh, fully, but they don't. That's the idea is that if in if they ever need to like put other stanchions, it's they could put other stanchions within that 20 foot swath. So we don't want it to read as a formal like hardscaped area. It's um, it's mostly like you know metal looking grass, basically mowed low. Is this similar to like the grass pave, like? Um... It's got like a sort of a, a membrane that's yeah, similar. Yeah, it's like yeah. a yeah. Um, we can get into details about that, but it's, it's permeable. Yeah. Our goal yeah. is that it's not a hardscaped area. Is our goal. We did something similar at Hickory Ridge for the access for the sewer line. Um, it's like a uh, almost like a plastic membrane that they put the the turf on, so it provides like a stable surfacing, and there's stone underneath it, so it's permeable. So I imagine something similar. Yeah, there are multiple styles of it. There are like, uh, I'm not, I'll check in with regard to like what exactly it is, but uh, on campus, we've used a few different styles. Um, you know, we, there's like math systems that we've had that allow like, you know, metal grasses to grow through. There's like a geogrid system that we've used that we've had success with. I'm not exactly sure what exactly it is, but the intent is that the 10 feet is uh, permeable asphalt and five feet is, you know, in, you know, meadow grass looking. That's the idea is that it's, it feels very narrow in regard to the serpentine approach to the, the complex itself. So I could follow up with more details with Aaron in regard to like what exactly that is, but I don't know if we have any of middles on exactly what the grid is yet or what the materials are. It's permeable. I'd like to see a detail for that. Sure. Any other questions yeah. or comments? I'll just comment one more, but like, as my understanding, that's a structural reinforcement, like a plastic or concrete grid. So grass at grade can grow over it, but um, within it, but trucks can drive on it. I can, I'm sure we have a detail um, in the plans. Yeah, it's mostly so, just to be clear, by the way, that it's mostly so that a truck can drive in that 10 foot lane. And if they need to put out stanchions, they can do so, but um again there's there's multiple assemblies for that i yeah i could probably even like uh check with the we, product manager regarding i do it. remember talking about this at length for hickory ridge so it's permeable but also big trucks can drive on it so it's functioning yeah and this, this is gonna be a common assembly you guys are gonna see because it's a good way to get through like nfpa 20 foot lanes nobody wants a 20 foot wide asphalt swath everywhere where you like, possibly need to get a fire lane through so that's um let me check and see if I have any info on that. Okay. While you do that, are there any other questions or comments from commissioners? Okay. 
Um, Jason, I know you wanted to see more about that. Is that going to hold you up on moving to close this public hearing tonight? No. Okay. Um, okay. If there's any public comment, please raise your hand. Otherwise, if there's no further comment from commissioners, I think we're looking to close the public hearing and issue the order of conditions. And thank you, um, Jason and Meredith, for addressing those outstanding issues that we had previously talked about. It's looking much better out there. Yeah, we appreciate your feedback and always engage in conversation going forward. So thank you. All right, I will move to close the public hearing and issue after the fact order of conditions DEP number 089-0738 with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws Article 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional conditions. Second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? You're an aye. Hand, Andre? Aye. Alex? <clears throat> Alex? I'll come back to Alex. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. Alex, do we have your audio? Okay, hearing nothing from Alex, um, is the, are we at uh, quorum on our current vote, Aaron? Yes, I think so. You're also muted. Um, yes, we do have a quorum. Okay, yep. all right. So I think we can move to close that one and hopefully Alex can join us with his audio on for the next one. Okay, thank you very much, Jason and Meredith. Thank Marinette. you very much, appreciate your time. Night. Thank you so thank much, you. good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, opening this public hearing it is now called to order. The hearing is held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands and most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection on the town of Amherst general bylaw. This is a Request for a determination for Goddard Consulting on behalf of Tom Reedy, Bacon Wilson, PC, to the confirm the accuracy of the resource area boundary on the site and whether the work proposed to construct a single family house and associated site work is jurisdictional under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and Regulations at Harkness Road, Map 18D, Lots 312. Okay, welcome Tom and Steve. Aaron, would you like to give us our five minute intro, please? Yes. Um, so um, we had a site visit on 827 um, and I pretty thoroughly checked the wetland line because um, I was really suspicious on this one that the wetland was beyond the, the flag line. Um, but in fact, it was very rocky and very sandy, and I didn't see any um, wetland veg that was beyond the flag line. So I don't have any, um, you know, objections to the flagged wetland boundary. Um, and I have a uh, motion queued up to issue the determination on this one. I do think, based on the configuration of the lot, that it's clear the um, efforts were made to keep the house um, structure as far away from the wetland as possible and to limit disturbance as much as possible in the buffer zone with the project. Um, the one thing I, oh, I, I do have your butter um, cards. I think this was the one where they sent them twice by accident, right? <laughs> yeah, I think they yeah. were sent twice yeah, by we, accident we on this one. So we do have the butter cards. Yes. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Bruce, do you have a logistic question? No, I I was at the site visit and it, Alex was there and it seemed like they've done what they can given the site constraints. Yeah, I appreciate that. Do Tom, Steve, or Barry, sorry, Barry, I missed you before, welcome. Um, anyone want to give a five minute presentation on it or uh, introduction? If you'd like it, I'm happy to show a plan. If you're okay with it, we don't have to do anything. It really is up to you. I think we're probably okay with it. Um, so thanks. thanks for keeping it out of the wetlands. Uh, yeah, I'd like to hear from fishers who did a site visit. So go ahead, Alex. 
I was on the site visit. It was a pleasure to meet Tom in person and uh, Mr. Roberts. And uh, I don't feel the need to have further explanation on the thing. It was uh, pretty straightforward. And Aaron did a very good job of checking the wetlands. I don't have any problem with it. Great. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Great. Okay. So we're looking for a motion to close public hearing and issue the amended order of conditions. I'll read it. <laughs> I'm <laughs> moved to close the public hearing and issue determination of applicability for Harkless Road Map 18D Lots 312, approving a positive determination checking box 2A, confirming bordered re uh, bordering vegetated wetland flags. WFGC through A1 to WFGC through A18 and box five, uh, confirming bylaw jurisdiction and a negative determination checking box three, approving work with noted conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. That is the longest con I've ever, we've ever had. <laughs> Second. Okay. Uh, we had Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Uh, Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. We appreciate it. You too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. So next up. Um, niche engineering. I think it's niche, niche possibly, okay. but they niche could, engineering. Yeah. I'll let them. I believe so. On behalf of Wayfinders Incorporated for their, oh, I'm going to open this. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required for the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection on the town of Amherst general bylaws. This is a notice of intent for niche engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Incorporated for the renovation of an existing school building, demolition of an existing parking lot, and construction of a new proposed residential building attached to the existing school. The associated site and utility improvements, including parking and stormwater management at 31 Southeast Street, Map 15A, Lots 20. I see a Coleman and a Jamie and a Josh. Welcome, everybody. Um, Aaron, would you like to give our five minute intro to this, please? Sure. So um, this is a, uh, a proposed affordable housing project. Um, the town of Amherst has been working for quite a while uh, with wayfinders on this site um, associated with this hearing and also the Belchtown Road site, which is the next hearing. Um, as part of that, the um, applicant has requested several waivers um, of the local um, uh, Town of Amherst bylaws um, in association with the filing. So um, for these two projects, the commission will be reviewing this strictly under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, and the applicant may have additional details on that, but that's just sort of a, a brief overview. This is similar to the um, Ball Lane project that we approved. Um, so uh, there were some very minor, a minor requests for adjustment of erosion controls on this, just to add some more significant erosion controls between the closest work area to the wetland boundary, um, which is an intermittent stream and associated bordering vegetated wetlands um, immediately adjacent to the existing basketball court, which is gonna be reduced in size and become partially parking area. Um, the critical piece for the commission to know about this site um, which is not a part of this application, is that the town has funding um, through the CDBG grant program um, for um, uh, doing some, some stream restoration work on this site. And so right now there's a the intermittent stream um, flows through two very undersized culverts which have failed going under the um, existing basketball court and discharge um, on the other side. So I believe they they come in on the north side and come out on the south side of the of the 
um, basketball court. Uh, we've explored um, multiple options for how to sort of restore the stretch of the stream, including um, conversations with multiple engineers and also DEP. And we've arrived that the um, sort of most um, effective and resource efficient and cost effective way to do this is to basically create a stream channel that re reroutes the stream essentially around this parking lot to its outlet point, which would be a stream and wet wetland restoration project. And it would be a um, filed under a separate permit as a resource area restoration project, which the town intends to do. And we currently have a engineer retained to do the design and ultimately the construction will be done on that by the town. So this is like a, um, a sort of a mitigation piece that's associated with this project that the town is going to be taking on, but there's going to be a separate permit filing for it, which is going to be happening after this permit is probably issued or, you know, I, I'm fairly certain that we won't be looking at it until after this permit is issued. So just so the commission's aware of that. Thanks, Erin. Um, would one of you like to give a presentation of this project? Five minutes, please. Sure, I'd like to. Go ahead, Jamie, take it away. Okay, I'd just like to give you a brief, brief overview. I know we're, uh, we're, we're pretty late here, but uh, you know, good evening. My name is Jamie Gruber. I'm a project manager in the real estate development department at Wayfinders. Uh, for you, uh, of those of you not familiar, Wayfinders is a local nonprofit based in Springfield that works across the housing spectrum from homelessness to home ownership. Um, I'm very excited to give you this brief overview of the proposed development that includes the creation of 78 units of mixed income and affordable rental apartments across two town-owned properties located at 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belchertown Road. At, the South, at Southeast Street, uh, we're proposing 31 unit building, including the adaptive reuse of the existing school and a new construction three-story addition. At 70 Belcher Town Road, we're proposing a new construction 47 unit uh, three story building. Both buildings will be designed and built to rigorous passive house standards with sustainability as a core goal. Um, they will provide barrier free buildings with elevator access to all floors and will also be all electric. Um, this development has been years in the making with a significant investment by the town of Amherst in the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust, including providing town land, town funds, and town staff time, all working collaboratively towards their goal to create more affordable housing. We're very grateful to be part of this development and for all the support we've received. Uh, Wayfinders was selected as the preferred developer by the town through an RFP process, and has been working on the due diligence and design over the past two years. The development will be funded by leveraging over $30 million in federal, state, and local sources, primarily through low-income housing tax credits. At the financial closing, the town will enter into a 99-year ground lease agreement, and once completed, Wayfinders will manage the property as it does for over 800 units in Western Mass, including two of its properties uh, in Amherst already, Olympia Oaks and Butternut Farms. As Aaron said, we're, we are permitting the project concurrently with the Zoning Board of Appeals through the 40B comprehensive permit process with hearings set to begin tomorrow evening. And what that'll do is, is you, you'll review it as the um, Conservation Commission for the, uh, the, the Wetlands Protection Act and any of the waivers that were requested or noted in the application will be granted um, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. You know, I appreciate the commissioner's time and service to hear this important matter. Now I'll turn it over to our civil engineer from Niche Engineers, Coleman and Josh, uh, to discuss the um, more project details. All right, thank you, Jamie. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Coleman Horsley. I'm a senior project engineer at Niche Engineering. Um, I'm here to present on the 31 Southeast Street site. Um, as you can see on your screen, um, there's the existing school building that was called out and most of the work is happening in this, you know, pork chop kind of portion. I'm um, in the front, the uh, back portion behind the basketball court is part of the wetlands um, and the wetlands extend into this property. And then also um, there's an approximate approximated wetland into this 47 Southeast Street property as well. Um, one of the major comments from the site walk yesterday with Aaron um, 
was uh, it gets a little tight on this end. Um, you can kind of see for the future construction, um, it gets a little tight to the existing fence and property line. Um, she recommended we do a silt fence in addition to a uh, mulch sock or compost sock uh, version control. Um, so the team will be looking into uh, beefing up the erosion control along that edge a little bit. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we are, you know, renovating the existing school structure, which is in the rear of the site. Um, that is within the 50 foot no structure, but we are seeking a waiver for that. Um, we are adding an addition um, to the east and then also to the, um, the south here of a three story building. Um, there'll be a long southeast street. And this will have associated utilities um, and a porous pavement uh, system in order to uh, manage the stormwater on site. Uh, the existing um, materiality is, you know, mostly impervious, um, especially near the wetland, um, with some impervious on the outskirts, and then the building in red on um, the existing building, and that's all within the hundred foot buffer, which you can see here. Uh, the proposed, we are switching the light blue is to porous pavement, so you know most of the impervious area is now being switched to porous pavement. Um, we are reducing some of the pavement areas um, near the wetland um, within 25 foot buffer um, and just slightly increasing impervious overall view count porous as impervious uh, within the 100 foot buffer. Um, the utility uh, as the stormwater plan, as mentioned previously, um, is the porous pavement system. We have extremely high groundwater on site. Um, in some places, it's as shallow as 0.7 feet below the surface. Um, so as a result, we are seeking a, a lined um, porous pavement system to keep groundwater out, um, but still allow uh, rate reduction and water quality uh, efforts um, meeting uh, the 80% TSS removal required by the Mass Stormwater Handbook. Um, snow storage will be kept out of the buffers completely. Um, you can see here, and then in extremely heavy rain uh, um, snowstorms, it will be uh, trucked off site. Um, and then as far as plantings go, I just wanted to provide you with a quick um, look at the plantings. Um, that the landscape architect has proposed for this site. Um, that said, I don't want to waste too much time. So I want to yield the rest of the time to questions. Thank you, Coleman. Um, Commissioner comments, questions. Bruce, go ahead. Um, could you go back to the very first slide that shows the aerial view, that one, and make it a lot bigger? So just this is an additional point to what Aaron said. If you look at, you just show, maybe circle where the current um, basketball court is, that. And th so the this daylighting of the stream is gonna go down where those little dots are and then over to the other part. And really what, as what she described, means that it's gonna be a connectivity between two isolated habitat, wetland habitats. And that's the town project, not theirs, but their link. And it's a really, it's a really good example of the need for connectivity and how to solve it. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And the porous asphalt will overflow to that area um, in the future. We're really excited to work with the town on that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. So we're here looking right now, we're looking at we're actually looking at two projects, right? With the northeast one and then the southwest one are different or like one's so the Belcher Town Road one? This project is uh, just Southeast Street. The next NOI um, hearing is for the Belcher Town Road. Um, okay. So we were going to present That's that That's not separately. on us map. Okay, got it. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, any other commissioner comments? So this is going to be continued tonight, but we're reviewing. Okay, um, Alex, go ahead. Muted, Alex. I was on the site visit and uh, very much appreciated the time that everybody took to explain things. And I know, I'm not sure it's clear, but for the benefit of other commissioners, because of the funding involved in this project, uh, Amherst, regulatory uh, wetland regs are waived. Yep. Um, and we'll get into that on our next hearing, I guess. So, um, but specifically that 50 foot uh, setback. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. 
Seeing none, I'm looking for a mo motion to continue the public hearing for DEP number 0890741 to 925.24 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Second. All right, Alex in the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you for that. I, I assume you're both, all of you are staying on for the next one? Correct. Great, okay. So this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being called as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands and most recently amended in article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. And this is a notice of intent for an engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Incorporated for the demolition of two existing residential dwellings and construction of a new proposed residential building with associated site and utility improvements, including parking and stormwater management at 7280 Belchertown Road, map 15C, lot 58, 59, and 60. Okay, Erin, please introduce us. Yeah, so um, we had a site visit um, also um, yesterday, was it? Um, and uh, during the site visit, there was a couple suggestions that I had made. Um, one of them was a uh, invasive species mitigation plan because in the back of the site, there's a significant amount of Japanese knotweed, um, which is located basically in the, in the vicinity of the wetland boundary and also where the um, proposed existing infiltration basin will be. Um, there's, I also requested some changes to the proposed BMPs, again, um, a more um, uh, robust um, erosion control as well as some um, sediment controls um, in the form of biodegradable erosion control blankets on the um, uh, section of the basin which is closest to the wetland to provide immediate stabilization measures once the grading is complete. Um, the other issue, I guess, or just sort of, I think this comes down to sort of uh, more of a minor adjustment is the the design which brands the um, infiltration basin on this site is located within the 50 foot buffer and infiltration basins can't be within 50 feet of a wetland um, per the DEP BMP handbook. So um, I'm had a conversation with the applicant that they may need to make some design considerations to either change it to an alternate BMP or shift it um, out of the 50 foot. So uh, they're working on coming up with an adaptive way to um, adjust and, and um, address that comment. Saren, um, would anyone like to give us an introduction on this one? I think Jamie already covered the introduction for both of them at the beginning, so I'll just jump right into the design if that's okay. Yep, go ahead. So um, you can see here, Belcher Town Road, uh, there's three parcels here that the town is consolidating for this project. Um, there's an existing structure at the rear of the site, um, and then uh, another existing structure at the front along Belcher Town Road in the 80 Belcher Town Road parcel. Um, as Aaron uh, noted, we are seeking some more extensive erosion control BMPs. Um, for uh, the rear of the site near the wetland, um, again, those are going to be, you know, mulch, uh, filter socks or um, compost, um, and then uh, jute or some sort of erosion control blankets um, to establish the vegetation near the uh, bioretention um, area in the back. Um, the building, the proposed building will be along the front of the parcels um, along Belchertown Road. Uh, very little of that building is actually within the 100 foot buffer and we'll go over that in a minute. Um, and then we will have an associated parking area uh, that goes to the rear um, for the residents. Uh, and then the bioretention uh, infiltration basin will be at the rear of the site. Uh, the existing materiality uh, within the 100 foot buffer um, is mostly pervious uh, with a little bit of impervious and then the existing structure. You can see the wetland lined here in red along the back. Um, additionally, this is the proposed conditions. You can see the grading of the basin. Um, so we're, we're trying to have uh, like a green infrastructure basin along the entire rear of the site to pick up any of the uh, pollutants that might come out from the parking area um, and runoff. So this runoff will be collected uh, via catch basins um, in the parking area um, routed to water quality structures. 
um, which then go to a flare down section and a rip wrap uh, st um, stone area before going into the infiltration basin body itself. Um, and then in, that will infiltrate down during most storm events. And then in heavy storm events, it will go through the rip wrap spillway and then overflow into the wetland itself. Um, uh, as Aaron noted, there was a comment from the DEP about um, 25 feet um, or uh, 50, uh, the infiltration basin being within 50 feet. The infiltration basin is the only stormwater BMP in the handbook that has that uh, setback requirement. Um, but we are actually seeking a more beefed up version of a infiltration basin. It's actually more of like a hybrid between a bioretention. Um, so we actually have a more um, sand. It's a, it's a sandier soil. It's got more filtration. Usually like an infiltration basin per the handbook is just grass on like an earthen subgrade. This is uh, like a planting mix with uh, restorative soils and, and seed mixing mixed in as opposed to just grass. So we're trying to go for more of a hybrid approach here. Um, and then just to close this out, snow storage again, outside the buffers near the front of the site. And then during heavy snowstorms, we trucked off. Um, and just to end it, the plantings uh, shown here are, you know, native plantings. And again, we're uh, looking to continue till the 25th for this one as well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner, questions, comments? I'm seeing none. Okay. Um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can see you now. Sorry, Bruce, go ahead. Alex and Jason, they were probably ahead of me. Okay. I couldn't see everybody with my screen. Uh, I'll just go with Alex. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, could you put up a graphic, please, which just shows the uh, buffers around the uh, wetland and, and that pertain, that are provided by the mass? Wetland Protection Act. Yep, absolutely. So this is the proposed site with, and then the hundred foot buffer, seventy five foot, fifty and twenty five right here, and then the wetlands in the red right in the back. And again, the green is the pervious area proposed. A lot of that is the infiltration bio basin hybrid structure. Uh, the blue is asphalt um, and concrete sidewalk, and then the red edge right here is the uh, lip of the building that falls within the buffer. So is there um, presumed to be one vehicle per unit? Is that how you determine the number of parking spaces? Uh, I'm gonna defer to Jamie on that one. Jamie, do you have the parking ratio? Yes, it's just under it's just under one um, parking space. It's it's like 0.97. So there's 46 um, spaces for uh, 47 units here. So if you were to reduce the parking to pull that back um would that necessarily mean that you have to reduce the number of units well i mean it's something that we'd be able to to look at i mean this is this is the plan that you know we're presenting and and you know we feel that the the parking is you know sufficient for the for the building you know as as is um and the goal, I think, was is to, um, you know, provide provide housing and provide housing units, and um, you know, we don't anticipate that every resident may own a vehicle, and this is in close proximity to, um, you know, walking to distance to downtown, but there's also bus, you know, very um, robust bus service just nearby across the street. So, but the the parking is, um, you know, what we're showing is is a almost you know a one to one um for this for this for this property okay i just had um two comments two two quick comments that are a tangent a bit on um, one is the house you're going to demolish i have no idea what the condition of the house is but there are people in town that are good at moving houses and i wonder if uh, contact can't be made with one or more of those individuals to see if that house is worth moving uh, under some other lot in order to provide housing. The second is just for the commission that this uh, this this new these these units will be within walking distance of the community garden, and in fact there could be a pathway provided from this property. Uh, uh, onto the uh, conservation land where the 
Fort River um, um, Community Garden is located. It's kind of uh, one of the goals of the community gardens is to provide gardening space for within walking distance of people. So it's just uh, ironic in a way that this is so close to the community garden. I think that's pretty nifty. Thank you. Well, Felix, Jason. Yeah, I was going <clears> to <throat> ask something similar to what Alex said about the parking, um, if it can be reduced. And then you mentioned that uh, the stormwater is going to be collected in the parking lot and then go to water quality structures before it goes to the biofiltration, infiltration basin combination. Um, what are those water quality structures and can additional space be made in the parking lot and the sides of the parking lot and the median in the parking lot for something like biofiltration prior to water or, or even infiltration prior to water getting into the larger basin so that the basin can potentially be reduced in size? We can certainly look into that. Um, the existing water quality structures we are looking at are, you know, it's sort of like a storm scepter system, so a hydrodynamic separator. Um, but we can definitely explore options of uh, some biofiltration or some sort of, uh, you know, filter strip along the edge of the parking as well. Thank you for the comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see, I, I like to see those center medians between the parking stalls be utilized as uh, water quality uh, post-construction BMPs. And then roof drainage, where does roof drainage go? I'll show you. So um, roof drainage is picked up from a numerous number of uh, downspouts um, and it's directed through um, subsurface uh, drainage piping, either through the parking lot or directly out to the side to the flare down section, rip wrap apron into the basin itself. So it ultimately makes its way over to the basin, um, either you know directly through the landscaping, through um, you know subsurface piping, or uh, connects to the larger uh, system that goes through the parking lot. Uh, but it skips the uh, water quality structures, obviously, because there's no TSS coming off of roofs. Can that or, or be, negligible amount? Yeah. Can that you know kind of same comment? Can that be re, can that be diverted elsewhere? As far as you know, not for water quality, but necessarily, but for quantity. To encourage more infiltration, we can we can explore that option. Oh, and I, I do want to note, actually, since you're mentioning it, we are meeting the MS4 requirements for this site. So we are getting the phosphorus and TSS removal um, as part of this basin. Um, and it's also providing the pollinator habitats uh, with the seed mix. So, you know, this is a really great green infrastructure option that we had to explore here um, with the groundwater being as deep as it is. It, you know, we really think it's a nice addition for the site. Sorry, you said the basin is is being utilized in that way? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So the basin is being used for phosphorus and um, TSS uh, treatment and it meets the MS4 uh, numbers. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Any other questions, comments? Bruce? Can you go back to slide two? It's the overview. Um, first slide? It's the very first one in the set. And then, yeah, now show the whole thing, not just the red part, but show the whole slide. Okay, so this is what Alex was talking about, because the community garden is up there in the upper center. And this is, uh, I'm, now I'm going to blank on the name of the, but this is a conservation area. And then my second part of it, is it correct, as I think we learned at the site visit, the town will continue to own the land in both of these examples, correct? That That is correct. There's a 99-year ground lease um, for these parcels, and then the structures will be built and you know owned by the developer. Um, and then at the end of the 99-year ground lease, obviously, they'll be worked out. But correct, right. the land will be continued so owned. You're going back and forth between us and the ZBA to mesh this together. Okay. Yep. And we did receive that comment from Aaron about um, potentially providing a path for um, the public to be able to access that uh, conservation area in the back. Um, and the team is looking into that um, to be, a, be able to provide that public access because that could be a great educational area. There's sort of a road that runs along the tree line there. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your Dave. 
But yeah, <clears throat> sorry, haven't spoken in a while. Um, yeah, just wanted to follow up on the comments about the community gardens. So this has all been part of the the, the longer term plan. The town owned the uh, owned the Street School, and we strategically, um, my staff and I, strategically bought these three lots, um, and um, with a plan in mind that these would be adjacent to the Fort River Conservation Area and i.e. the um, community gardens, as Alex noted. Um, whether a trail is created directly from the, the, um, the, um, the complex or whether uh, we can work on some public access down the existing way is something to be determined in, in the future. I will say that the back of this site on the conservation side is all wetlands. So it, it's certainly challenging from that perspective. The other piece of this is that staff fully had in mind that um, we would eventually connect the Fort River Farm Conservation Area and the gardens with the new Fort River School with a bridge over the Fearing Brook to the north in this slide. So this is all part of a about a five-year plan to increase the number of affordable housing units while also providing access to conservation land trails, fishing, hiking, uh, walking, and of course, community gardens. So thanks. Ms. Dave, Jason. Um, is the road work that is currently occurring in front of this project associated with this project or is that separate from this project? It's separate. Um, we're coordinating with the, with Jason, the town engineer, um, to, you know, work out utility stubs and curb cuts, but it's a separate project. Okay. If I could just add, so, yeah. so it is, it's funded by CDBG, the community development block grant funds. And um, those are the same funds that we're going to be using to do the stream restoration uh, project that was mentioned earlier over on the East Street School site. Um, but yeah, the road work and sidewalk work is funded by CDBG. And again, was planned in part to serve the, the uh, Wayfinders project that's before you tonight. Thanks. Erin? I was just going to say that um, walking the site, there's sort of an existing natural opening between this property and um, uh, Fort River Farm. So, um, yeah, Dave, if it's not appropriate to put a connection between the two, I sort of my comment with that was, you know, I think there's going to be a beaten path created, <laughs> like a desire line created, no matter what, um, with but with the base in there that they may want to plan to have like some sort of a walkway or something so that people aren't just like trudging through their basin to get to it um it might be something to sort of just consider in the design that uh that there's this open access to a conservation land right behind this the property that people might naturally want to get to Thanks, Sarah. And I was thinking the same thing that you could probably assume there'd be some kind of uh, path forging by people. So just to assume it and maybe direct them in some subtle ways um, to keep them out of places you don't want them to go, especially if there's going to be a bridge there later. Um, but it's a nice connection and connectivity project. So it looks really awesome. Okay. Any other comments, questions? If there's public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none from anybody else. Um, looking for a motion to continue this public hearing for DEP number 0890740 to 9252024 at 7:35 p.m. So moved. Second. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. <laughs> Laura? Bruce? Bruce and Laura, your mics are muted. M and I, for the record. How about Alexa? Hi. Don't say her name. <laughs> She'll vote. Laura? Ah. OK, I don't have Laura, but uh, I think we have um, enough people on this one so we can move on all right thank you everybody have a good night thank you thank you thank you
Can okay, I I'm just going to announce that if there's any general public comment, please raise your hand. I'm going to keep an eye on the room. I think we only have one more thing to get to, and that's our uh, last enforcement. Is that right? Is everybody okay? So Aaron and I talked about this. I don't know who's had a chance to read the most recent communications. Um, basically, the status is there's been a seed mix, a wetland, uh, native wetland seed mix that's coming up in sort of the sunny periphery of the the forest and the yard. Um, so that's good. And there's things coming up um, in the woods. Um, the landowner is concerned that the, the planting plan that we um, had talked about would be disruptive to the current uh, growing natural infill of plants on the property and this sort of, I guess, pushing back on whether or not to do it. So he has a point and, al and also just sort of the um, disturbance of the soil back there. Um, the seed mix that's coming up, um, some of it is um, annual species. It's generally associated with like the sun line. Um, it's kind of hard to see what's further down the line, but it it looks okay. I mean, there's like hay scented firm coming up. Um, we had discussed that um, maybe he could put in the rebar. He's going to do the rebar caps that we talked about. So if, if you looked at the pictures, they're these bright orange caps so that there's, you know, taking care of the safety concern of having exposed rebar and then covering them with rocks and then maybe allowing for the natural succession to happen, doing a site visit in, in September. And then at that point, sort of assessing whether or not we still feel that he should move forward with replanting the disturbed um, buffer down to the river. So that was what Aaron and I discussed. And I just wanted to get a read from commissioners on that and, and see if anybody also looked at, at the pictures. And I guess the, the one last thing I wanna add is that in the pictures, I was concerned that there might have been some invasive species popping up back there, and some of them are woody, and I did maybe see some like oak saplings, and, and that's just relevant because way back <laughs> before many of you were on this commission, the original um, interactions we had was he wanted to clear this area for a view of the river. So our conditions are that he can't cut or trim or anything right now, but there are saplings coming up. So it's just one thing to think about if there's big saplings coming up, there might be um, a desire to cut them back. So I wanna be realistic about what we're requiring, what's happening and just what the commissioner's standpoint is on the plantings or not the plantings. So with that, I'll just open it up for comments. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. So can you clarify the the oak trees? If there's saplings coming up that they may want to clear them in the future. I'm not I'm not quite following what, what that Sorry. Line. I mean that's just totally uh subjective because okay, so several permitting processes ago, this site came to us because they wanted to clear understory and trees to have more of a view through the property. And so they did that. And then there is all of this disturbance. And now there are small saplings coming up, as you would expect in a disturbed area, but they're tree saplings. So eventually they're going to be bushy and obscure the view that they're, they originally wanted to have. Maybe they don't care about that anymore. I mean, I'm just like, throwing things out there. I just want to consider yeah. what we're saying they can or can't do and being realistic about it. That's all. Are we, are we concerned that, I mean, they got, they were able to, that was the original thing, right? They wanted to clear a little bit. They cleared way more than they were supposed to. Correct. And yeah. now we have saplings coming in where they were. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not that, I take the position that we'll let the saplings grow. Um, that's my position. And as far as the planting of the planting plan, um, yeah, I'll defer to the two of you. I think I would like to see the plantings planted or maybe a reduced planting plan in areas that don't have uh, natives coming up now. I would be in favor of that. 
I don't want them to go and disturb anything. If there's good stands of vegetation coming up, I don't think they should be disturbed just to plant something. But in areas where there's not good stands of vegetation, I think they ought to continue with the planting plan. Yeah, and and the plantings are shrubs so that they have sort of a max height limit, which is also beneficial. Okay, Alex? Can you remind me where their property boundary is? I'm not quite sure if they own down to the brook. Um, and without knowing where their boundary is, I'm not quite sure what they could cut anyway. So the um, the top of the slope where the rebar is, that's the 100 foot buffer boundary. But they, um, and I, I, I can't tell you the exact measurement, but they don't own all the way down to the stream. I think there's approximately like 25 or 30 feet between the stream and their property line. And that area where the stream is located is on um, uh, Amherst Woods uh, Association land. Hmm. Yeah, so on their site, they leveled the back of the house and built a very large patio. So visually, they look over their lawn they'll see the shrubs that are planted near the edge of the lawn, but they're not able to view down to the stream on an everyday basis. They have to walk to the edge of their lawn to look down in there. So as, as Michelle said, it may not be an issue to them anymore. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I guess I think one of our conditions is they don't cut anymore. So we just need to reinforce that and you know it may be point out to them if they don't want to have saplings coming up putting in the shrubs would actually help prevent big succession from coming in but i think you know what you said jason if there's already growth in there that's looking good there's no point in planting anything so that's why i was thinking we would just give it a little time and maybe take a visit at the end of the month at the end of september and um, revisit what we think is appropriate for planting go ahead bruce I agree with what you just said. Aaron? I just wanted to say I agreed with Jason. You know, my concern was if there's all this herbaceous vegetation, native herbaceous vegetation coming in, and we've got native woody vegetation coming in, that I wouldn't want us to prescribe that he go out there and have a bunch of people tromping around, stepping on all of this vegetation that's established and final stabilization that's establishing to put in more and just in my experience with planting plants that you don't want to overplant because if you overplant then it starts to become like you know things are out competed things start dying so I just think yeah giving it another month we've had a pretty good growing season um this <laughs> this summer with all the rain um to let the let the seed come in and see what it looks like and if we do have bare spots we could you know have some replanting but the other piece I wanted to say is when we've reached a point where we think that they've achieved compliance we would issue them a letter that states you know you've we believe you've achieved substantial compliance with the enforcement order however in order to maintain that compliance this is a mitigation area this this is this is not even a buffer anymore. It's a mitigation area. Beyond those rebar markers is a no disturb zone in, into the future. This is a mitigation area you've established to compensate for a violation that you committed. And there is no cutting back here. There's no landscaping back here. There's no dumping back here. Be sent via certified mail and attached to their property file in the town so that if there was any activity like cutting of, you know, uh, oak saplings or or otherwise back there, um, you know, they should know better. Okay, so we maybe you could um, just communicate that we'll entertain his um, idea about letting things grow in and then revisit it later this season. And I just think it absolutely needs a site walk because it's really hard to tell from the pictures. So if everyone's okay with that. That will be what we convey. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I see no public comment, so with no further ado, I think we can close the meeting tonight. Bruce. I just wanted to ask Aaron, um, as far as you know, has the state or MACC or anybody else 
done, say, a study of things that, you, like what you just described, that were put in place 10, 15 years ago, and what has actually happened in the meantime to those mitigation areas in terms of their disturbance or living up to the letter of the letter uh, that you gave, or does anybody know what actually happens down the road? What a great question, Bruce. Something to look. We can ask MAC to do it, but anyway. I have an anecdotal story. Um, in my neighborhood, there is a covenant on the deeds when it was developed that you could only take down like 20% of the trees on a lot. And the neighborhood is still very forested. I think people like that. But then septic started failing and trees had to come down and it was sort of a slippery slope about aesthetics and what was acceptable. But there was like a big neighborhood uprising in the 90s where they got lawyers and neighbors together to like fight these developers that were clearing lots because it was against the covenant on the deed. But it was a new developer that bought it, you know, 25 years later and they didn't care and there was no teeth to it. And so it just doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's like sort of, you know, the intent is sort of there, but um, eventually people figure out that no one's going to come after them or find them and they just do it anyway. Yeah, it's, it's really challenging. Um, you know, Michelle and I had this conversation earlier. You can't record an enforcement order because it encumbers a deed and a tarnishes the title basically so it can cause the landowner to have basically legal recourse against the town or the conservation commission if that happens um you know really our our only um strength is in our orders of conditions which we can record and have ongoing um conditions in our in our certificates of compliance um and then, you know, there's conservation restrictions, which are a separate easement process, but it's, it's, it's always been a, a difficult um, row to hoe, so to speak, with like making sure that things are completed, making sure things are maintained. Um, and yeah, I think it's a case by case basis and how diligent and how much um, like institutional memory an organization has to be able to like trace back what those requirements were and it's challenging okay sorry to bring it up at the last but you know, appropriate no it would be a very interesting study if macc wanted to do it <laughs> the outcome okay thanks bruce well looking for a motion to close a motion to adjourn Second. Third. Chased on, the, chased on the motion. Andra in the second. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.